Mr. Goldman, you know, you can't do this. You can't publish this. It isn't right. And Albert Goldman's response was basically, look, this is the book I'm going to write. I'm not changing my mind on it. That's the breaks. I'm one of the best investigative reporters, I think, in the world today. <laughs> So just wanted to do a really quick little intro to this video. It was shot in two parts. After watching what we had, I thought it might be helpful to just kind of explain a little bit about this video. It was originally intended to be a follow-up video to a visit to Lamar Fike's gravesite in Mark, Texas that we had done back a couple months ago. After doing that, we wanted to kind of do a little bit of a tribute video to Lamar, just share a little bit about his life, his experiences with Elvis. He is somebody in the Elvis story that's always been a favorite of ours. I wanted to do for a while a longer video about him. So we decided to do that as a follow-up to the grave video. There is a certain aspect of Lamar's story that was bound to come up. It's something that often comes up in discussions about Lamar and we felt like we were going to not shy away from it and just kind of address it head on and that was Lamar's involvement in the 1981 biography of Elvis um, by Albert Goldman. Um, so we decided that we wanted to go ahead and include that, research what we could find out about Lamar's role in it, realized we didn't really know a lot about the specific We'd heard different things, we'd heard Lamar share different parts of the experience, but there were some things about it that were a little unclear. Originally this was one full video of a Lamar biography um, with this information included, but after watching that, we realized that this really should be its own video. When we do the Lamar tribute story, we really just want that to be a celebration of Lamar and his life. We also did feel like it was important to cover this area because it is something that comes up a lot, and we knew it was bound to come up in discussions. This video this video here focuses more on Lamar and the writing of that book, his role in it. It's sort of a precursor to the next video we're going to do on Lamar. So we thought we'd go ahead and get this one out of the way, just sort of cover this head on um, before moving on to the next video. A couple of things after watching uh, the, the video that we have that I just wanted to kind of throw out there. One thing that I neglected to mention in the filming of that video is that when this book was originally published, on the cover of the book, based on the recollections of Lamar Fike and the American people, was part of the original title of the book. That was part of the first edition. It came off in subsequent editions, according to Lamar, based off of Al Albert Goldman's wishes, which Lamar agreed with. So I just wanted to kind of make sure that that part was clear, because I don't think we mentioned it in the first one. The other thing is, a lot of the information that I got from Lamar's words about specifically his involvement in the writing of this book came from Alana Nash's Oral History of the Memphis Mafia. That book, I believe, is called Recollections of the Memphis Mafia. It's a really awesome book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, it's based on, it's an oral history of interviews that she did with Marty Lacker, Billy Smith, Lamar. Really, really, really fun book to read. These guys share their stories, so highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Another thing that I mention in the, the, the video is that the Albert Goldman book was originally hyped up and marketed to the public as what was going to sort of be the be-all, definitive, end-all biography of Elvis. I do want to mention that although this book is not that, what most people consider to be that book are the Peter Galeranak series, Last, Last Train to Memphis, and Careless Heart, The Unmaking of Elvis Presley. These are really what ended up being considered the gold standard of Elvis biographies. They cover a lot of the ground that's covered in the Goldman book, however, in a more balanced, more fair, more objective light. Um, so if you haven't read those books also, and you are looking for the definitive Elvis biographies, that's the place that you want to go. I apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry. Another thing I did want to mention about the rest of this video, after having watched what we filmed, the day that we filmed the first part of the video, I was having a problem with my eye. So I was experiencing a little bit of eye pain, light sensitivity. Um, because of that, I didn't realize when we were filming it, but I think because my eye was in some pain, I'm looking down a lot in the video. It's a little distracting. It's a little weird. I apologize for that. I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you so much. So one thing I did want to address with Lamar is Lamar's role in the writing of the 1981 Albert Goldman biography on Elvis. And 
I really think this book in a lot of ways has lost its relevance. So it's not my intent to really focus on that. Um, but I am interested in Lamar's role in it because I realize that this is something that has come to really define Lamar for a lot of people. And it's a bit of a blemish on his legacy. I really wasn't 100% clear about exactly what Lamar's role in this book was. He did try to distance himself from it. He was um, publicly very unhappy with the end result of it. So I was a little bit curious about finding out about that and how involved or not involved Lamar actually really was. Doing this, I'm just going through biographies, articles that were published at the time, reviews, interviews Lamar gave, um, you know, any information that was available. And there wasn't a ton. There was enough for me to kind of piece some things together and maybe get a little bit of an idea of what happened. But there's a lot I don't know as well. And, you know, full disclaimer, as with everything in the Elvis world, whether or not this is 100% accurate, how true it is, is something I can't speak to. Um, the only thing that I do know is that this is what is available from researching. One thing that Lamar was pretty upfront, pretty honest about was that following Elvis's death, he was going through a period of financial hardship. Um, he had some gambling debts. He was going through a divorce, some medical problems. So uh, that along with mourning Elvis, this was a pretty rough period of his life. Lamar was friends with a man named Kevin Eggers who worked in publishing. Lamar had first met him when he was working for Hill and Range and they became friends. And Kevin Eggers suggested to Lamar that he should look into maybe shopping the idea around to different publishing houses. Lamar being paired with a serious writer to create sort of what was going to be the definitive, epic, be all end all of Elvis biography. That is not the legacy of this book. That's not where we landed in the end. Um, but it seems like, you know, from a variety of different sources, this was the original intent. There were a lot of people in Elvis's circle who went on to write books about their time with Elvis, but these were generally books about them, autobiographies that were essentially memoirs of their time with Elvis. So, and you can tell by the titles, um, Elvis and me, me and a guy named Elvis, Elvis my best man, um, you know, and so on and so on. So they were autobiographies of these people in a sense, but they were largely more memoirs of the time that they spent with Elvis and their experiences with him. So they kind of followed a very general format of a little bit of information about them prior to meeting Elvis, and a little bit about their lives post Elvis, what the intent here was. Maybe they were trying to take a little bit of a unique angle on this, but it seems like the intent was that Lamar had a wealth of knowledge and personal memories of Elvis, and that being paired with a biographer, this could really make the, the ultimate biography. And at this time, there hadn't really been a serious, in-depth, comprehensive biography on Elvis. So I think the idea was that Lamar had a unique perspective and a lot of memories and a first-hand view. And paired with a serious writer, this could really be an epic book. They shot this idea around to a number of different publishing houses before finally finding one who was interested. And the editor, uh, this was from an interview with Albert Goldman, the author. What he said was that the editor at the publishing house thought of him. And a little bit of history on Albert Goldman at the time that he was tapped to be part of this project. He was a former academic. He was considered to be a bit of an intellectual. He taught at Columbia University for a while. He had really made more of a name for himself in writing as a music critic and sort of a cultural observation critic of sorts. Um, he seemed particularly fascinated in the counterculture. And he had recently written a biography on the comedian Len Lenny Bruce, which was very well received. There was some flack that had come from Lenny Bruce's family and friends about the accuracy of some of the claims in the book. But by and large, compared to Albert Goldman's later books, this book was fairly tame. The editor thought that in trying to pair somebody who could take a really comprehensive academic approach to Elvis with the memories that could, Lamar could share, that this could be a really good fit. So usually when biographers are writing books, they, they will interview subjects, they'll have, you know, they could get a lot of information from people who agree to be interviewed and they pull a lot from that. But Lamar's role was a little bit bigger than that. He certainly seemingly gave a lot of material, a lot of content, a lot of stories. So there's no doubt about that. But he also was involved in the research end from what he said, which is, you know, an unusual role. Generally, people who are interview subjects are not working for the author per se or completing their research. But it seems like this was a pretty exhaustive process for Lamar. He said he worked on it for three years. He did a lot of research. He talked about going to Mississippi and 
going through Elvis's family records, finding out a lot of new things he hadn't known. One very interesting thing that did come out of this book is that this book was the book that essentially broke the case on the Colonel's true identity. And Lamar, it seems, was very integral to this part of it. So this is an interesting side note about something that happened during the research process from the book. It had come to their attention because somebody had found a very obscure self-published 64 page book slash booklet that had been written in 1970 published in the netherlands by a man named hans langbroek this book was called the hillbilly cat and it was a little very slight book about elvis that this person had written um but in it in a very unceremonious way he had revealed the colonel's identity and i have not ever seen a copy of this book i've seen some photo some photocopies of the pages but from what i've read it's just sort of like in the middle of a chapter about the colonel he just has a very brief sentence where he says something like and the colonel's true identity was andreas van kick and he's originally from the town of Breda Holland. That's it. And then he goes on to the next thing. So in this book, it's not revealed like it's a big shocking secret or a big bomb is being dropped. It's just kind of something that's just very matter of fact thrown in. This book had come to the attention of Albert Goldman while he was writing and he shared it with Lamar. And Lamar said at first he thought, this is ridiculous, this can't possibly be true, there's no way, but decided to research it a little further. Um, ended up getting in touch with a journalist in the colonel's birth town in Holland who confirmed that yes this is true I've I've covered it I've written articles about it I've interviewed his family I believe this is 100 percent true and so at that point having somebody that was able to back it up and provide a little bit more credibility to it Lamar said that he started to think about it a little bit and begin to notice things about the colonel that sort of indicated that maybe there could be some truth to this. He said that when he, he was thinking about this, he was thinking about certain affectations in the colonel's accent at times, things that sounded maybe a little foreign, um, phrases that he would use and what Lamar had always assumed was maybe some German that the colonel might have picked up through the years. But when he started to really kind of think about these things that occurred to him, you know, there there may be something to this now that I think about it. So he decided that it was a lead worth pursuing. He ended up going to Holland, to the colonel's birthplace, meeting his family. And the way that Lamar describes it, essentially the colonel's sister opened the door and he, he was looking at the colonel as a woman. Um, <laughs> or he was looking at a female version of the colonel. Um, and so that was pretty compelling for him. He he believed after seeing the colonel's family just and, and having that kind of sight confirmation, as well as photos that they shared of the colonel as a young man, he began to believe that this was true. When he came back, he was sharing this with Albert Goldman. They were kind of going through it, trying to figure it out. Uh, Lamar was very convinced at this point. He thought what he saw was was very compelling, but they didn't quite have enough proof. There wasn't There wasn't quite... A smoking gun per se they, they had the fact that his relatives looked very much like the colonel and they had some pictures of him when he was young but but not enough to really make it 100 percent verifiable so at that point lamar decided hey you know i've known this man the colonel was still living at this point i've known this man for decades why don't i just i could just call him so he did he said to the colonel and this is kind of famous this is something lamar repeated a lot he said to him how come you never told me that your name was really Andreas Van Kiek? And the colonel's response to that was, well, you never asked. Um, so that was really how that story was discovered. Lamar played a very large role in it. Um, Lamar also did a lot of research trying to track down his military records, anything that he could find about the colonel's backstory. So Lamar was very involved in that particular aspect. He talked about when he was on the way, his way to meet the colonel's family, that he had a sense of, of possibly be on, being on the verge of a very monumental discovery and that this was very surreal to him. He also talked about how shocking this revelation was to him. It, it hit him in a real personal way because he had a long history with the colonel. He had known him for many years. And I, I get the impression that that aspect of working on the book was something that Lamar both enjoyed and was exhausted by. He described this experience as being very exhaustive. The research was extremely comprehensive. He put a lot into that part of it. There's no denying Lamar's involvement in that part of things. Um, I think where this gets tricky is trying to figure out what the dissonance between the creation of the book, the research process, the parts that Lamar was actively contributing to, and what the final outcome of the book was. 
According to Lamar, he really didn't have an idea of the tone that Albert Goldman was going to take or what the final content of the book would be until he saw the galley proofs. And at that point, he was extremely disappointed and really did not want to be associated with this. These are his words. You can't do this. You can't publish this. It isn't right. And Albert Goldman's response was basically, look, this is the book I'm going to write. I'm not changing my mind on it that's the breaks. And Lamar said Albert Goldman was just not somebody that you could change the mind of. You know, he had a very specific idea by that point of the book that he wanted to write and there was no talking him out of it. And I can say Albert Goldman strikes me as somebody who had a pretty healthy ego. So I believe that. <laughs> um, I think that's very credible. Um, Lamar himself described the tone of the book as hateful. Now, Lamar owned a third of the copyright, which is another unusual thing about this. It's it's just a little bit different from, I think, the, the normal writing and research process of a book to have a figure like Lamar involved in that way. So I think it was something that was maybe, if, if the author went in a direction with it that Lamar wasn't comfortable with, or if something, you know, kind of went sideways in that process, there was sort of the potential for there to be an immediate conflict there. And that's exactly what happened. One thing that Lamar said when it came to where he felt the book kind of ultimately veered from his, his initial expectation of it when the project started had to do with personality, Albert Goldman's personality. And I can say that I think that the biographies of Albert Goldman are much more about Albert Goldman than they are his subjects. There's a lot of his personality that comes through in these books. I learned a lot more about the way Albert Goldman thinks, his ideas, his beliefs on things, or his perceptions of things, uh, his values than I did any of his subjects. For those who haven't read this book, what I will say about it is that Albert Goldman has a tone that is very satirical, it's very caustic, it's very cynical, um, it's very sensationalistic. The only way that I can really describe his writing style is if Oscar Wilde and Truman Capote and Kitty Kelly had a baby altogether that was writing a long syndicated series for the National Enquirer, this is how this would read. Um, if somebody handed me this book and said, hey, this is a really dark satire <laughs> on a character loosely based on Elvis, I don't think the end result would look too much different. Um, and so I think what it really comes down to with this book has to do with the tone. A lot of the content, the events, the stories are things that you will encounter in other biographies and other books, even in other interviews and things like that. So it's not, I wouldn't say that reading it, there was a whole lot that was brand new to me. Now that said, there, there are a few things that I think are, you know, spattered throughout that were new. And a lot of those are kind of in this very cagey way. Um, just referred to as rumors. They're, they're not backed up. They're very fleeting. He also has a way of implying something, but it's vague enough that you read the sentence a couple of times and you're not really sure what he means. It suggests something, but he doesn't go as far to back it up. One of the unfortunate things about the legacy of this book is that I think it was responsible for kind of creating this satirical, sensationalistic, cartoonish version of Elvis and because this was the first serious in-depth biography that had been written and because it had been hyped up to the public as something that was going to be the be-all end-all serious definitive biography on Elvis um, a lot of the stories in this were new people hadn't really heard this information before because it was presented in such a sensationalistic tone and I think it's fair to say that there was a, a great deal of embellishment, um, some things that were probably just completely made up. Because this was the first time that the public was encountering a lot of this information, it really cemented this this image. There are some points where he says, nope, that was an absolute lie, that was total BS, I don't know where he got that from, that wasn't part of the research. There are other parts where he'll acknowledge there was a kernel of truth there, but this got exaggerated and distorted. And, and too much was made of it. And there are other points where he'll even say, you know, I think he was right about that. And Lamar was certainly not the only person who contributed to this book. Another role that Lamar played was to use his connections in the Elvis world to set up interviews, connect Albert Goldman with people to talk to. 
And certainly other people are referenced in interviews. Definitely other people were talked to. Their quotes and stories are in the book too. But one thing that's really cagey about this book is that it's not cited to any significant degree at all. So there are a lot of really outrageous statements and claims with no citation. I think the assumption that is that has been made about this is that most of that must have come from Lamar because we know he was the primary source. Um, but there's really no way to tie where some of this information came from. Lamar is referenced through the book, but if you didn't know that he had this this involvement with it, you really wouldn't think that he was anything other than another interview subject. He's mentioned sparingly here and there. He's never really referenced as being the primary source of the material. And the citations for the material are essentially non-existent. So it's very hard to tell what came from who. Um, you know, if there actually really was a real source for a lot of this information, um, which is a pretty cagey thing about the book, I think. Another thing about this book is that Albert Goldman is definitely an equal opportunity offender when he's writing about people in the book, even very, very minor figures in the story or people that he's paying compliments to, they're backhanded compliments. He, he can't really introduce a new person to the story without having some snarky observation about them. And even when he's trying to be nice about somebody, he, he does it in a very backhanded kind of way where there's also a sarcastic observation. And this is definitely true of Lamar. He doesn't seem to have any favoritism to Lamar when he's telling the story. I guess I'll put it like that. Every time he's mentioned, he's described as fat boy, big fat Lamar. I think there's a section where he says something like, Lamar couldn't possibly have ever worked on Elvis's security team because all he could have done was sit on somebody. Um, so, I mean, you know, if that gives you any indication of both Albert Goldman's tone and his opinion of his subjects and also what his relationship with Lamar was. I think that's a little revelatory. There are also a lot of pieces in this book that I think in 2023 are pretty cringy in the sense that Albert Goldman steps out of the narrative a little bit to give this kind of pseudo-intellectual dime store psychoanalysis. A lot of stuff just does not read well today. I don't think that Lamar was responsible for any of that. That seems pure Goldman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, we, we don't really have any way of knowing where Lamar's contribution stopped and where Goldsman's embellishment began. But I think what we can look to are other interviews that Lamar gave, other documentation of his telling of events, because I think that gives us an idea of most likely what he was providing. You can also see the, the core of that in the Goldman writing if you kind of you know, strip past the, the embellishments he put on it and the personal touches he put on it. Robert Goldman had a very unique writing style. And I think if we compare it with his second book on John Lennon, it gives us a really clear idea uh, that this was a consistent thing for Albert Goldman. Um, and I think if he, had if he had lived and he had continued to write, we would have seen this repeated time and time again because he really seemed to enjoy this status. And so that does give us a little bit of indication of where his filtering of the work stepped in. Whether or not anybody selling their stories on someone they were close to who's deceased is a form of exploitation. I think that that's a question that's worth asking. I think in this case, because so many people in the Elvis world have done this from minor acquaintances to people who were very close to him, that at some point it's fair to assume that whether or not Lamar had sort of kicked this off with his book, and, and really you could say that it was kicked off prior to that. If we look at what happened as the first in that genre, then L Lamar, didn't exactly get the ball rolling, um, but he certainly played a part in a very, very high profile example. And, you know, granted, the other people who used their memoirs and recolle recollections for books took a much softer tone, um, took a much more respectful tone than Albert Goldman did. But I do think that everybody, you know, in their own way, some of it for money, you know, some of it for attention, some of it because they just genuinely wanted to share their stories. 
some of it because they knew that there were an audience of Elvis fans who really wanted to hear their stories, you know, and I'm, and I'm glad these stories are here, you know, because in a way, when it comes to the private Elvis, it's the closest thing that we have. And I think Elvis is somebody that we feel like we all know and have a very clear handle on and idea of, but in a lot of ways, he remains an enigma. And what we have are what was left behind by these accounts to try to patch together. And I'm glad these accounts are here. The Goldman book, debatable. <laughs> um, but generally, the idea that these accounts exist, you know, absolutely. So well, I think that it is a question worth asking whether it was exploitive for Lamar to partake in the process in the first place. I think when it comes to people in the Elvis world, everybody's crime is nobody's crime after a point. Um, and I think that whether the Goldman book existed or not, it would have come to the point where everybody was was writing their stories and selling their stories. I think that was inevitable. And I think we benefit from the stories, you know, whether or not you agree with everything everybody said or think that maybe it was distasteful for them to share certain things or things like that. I'm glad that I'm glad these stories are out here. You know, I'm glad that we have them to look through and I will continue to read any Elvis book that I can get my hands on. What really informed this book was Albert Goldman's writing style and his poison pen style, so to speak. I think that if you look at how this sort of played out in his subsequent writing and what we know of him, his own quotes about himself, this was a guy who really liked himself a lot and was very unapologetic about being a contrarian. I think that's a safe expectation with me because I'm one of the best investigative reporters, I think, in the world today. So I do think there's a clear cut case to be made that it was not Lamar's intent for the book to be as sensational as it was and that Albert Goldman did take liberties, that he did embellish things. You know, I think he got the core of a lot of this from Lamar, but I don't think that it was Lamar's intent for for this to be the hatchet job that a lot of people feel it ended up being. A little bit about Lamar's life after the book. So he did try to distance himself from it. He shared that after writing the book, he was absolutely exhausted. This had been a very stressful experience for him. At one point, Lamar did have gastric bypass surgery and got down to 155 pounds. However, um, there were some complications with the surgery. He became ill after a motorcycle accident when he had to be operated on anyway, and they saw the condition that he was really in from the medical complications he was having from the surgery. The doctors decided to just go ahead and reverse the bypass surgery. He did regain weight. And after the book, he was in the car business for a while. According to him, he lost about a million dollars doing this um, <laughs> when things went belly up. He did eventually end up back in Nashville working in the publish the music publishing business again. He continued to be a very frequent presence in documentaries. Um, he was interviewed for a lot of biographies. He, he did fan events on that circuit. So he remained a very visible and active figure in the Elvis world until his death. I hope that you've enjoyed this video on Lamar. Um, as I said before, he is absolutely one of my favorites in the story. If you are also a Lamar enthusiast, please drop a line. If you are not a Lamar enthusiast, please feel free to drop a line. I understand in the Elvis world that there are a lot of different opinions. And one thing that I really love about this fan community is the passion and the investment that people have. I know people have differing opinions on things and we don't always agree, but I welcome all discourse. I, I enjoy talking with other fans. I enjoy hearing other people's opinion. If I do make any other videos like this, um, I invite people to comment. I, I want this to be a place where people can express their opinions and points of views and feelings about things in the story in a civil way. Um, so I look forward to hearing what you have to say. If you didn't like this video, you can tell me that too. It takes a lot to get me angry. Um, <laughs> I welcome your feedback. Um, thank you so much for watching. Take care. Albert has, has left, left the building. building.